Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's going straight into the next question. Um, so here we have three panelists, uh, two online, one here uh, with me. Um, panel on the preserving of elect electoral integrity in the digital age. Uh, we thought this is one of the themes that we cover this year at uh, GNET. There's a couple of big, you may have noticed, big elections coming up, uh, and not just uh, in Europe and the United States, but 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 beyond. And in fact, we're going to be looking uh, beyond first. Uh, I'll just qu quick overview and introduction of our speakers. Uh, Benjamin Mock, who uh, joins me here today, is a senior analyst at the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, that's the RSIS. Uh, very well-known institution. I'm sure many of you are aware of it. Um, did his master's at NYU, uh, moved to the private sector for a bit as a security specialist um, before moving to RSIS. And he will talk to us about uh, the Indonesian challenge. Um, after that, we're going to hear from uh, John uh, Sunday Ojo. Uh, John is a doctoral candidate at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter uh, School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason. Uh, he has an MA in uh, Global Development from Leeds University and MSc in Urban Management and Development uh, from Rotterdam. Uh, he's a fellow at the United Nations Association of the National Capital Region uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, and the Global uh, Research Network in the U.K. He's also an ambassador uh, for peace at the London Peace Research Institute, and he is uh, going to speak to us about Boko Haram's attempt to interfere with elections in Nigeria. Uh, and finally, Jacob Ware uh, is a research fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, he's also adjunct professor uh, at Georgetown University's uh, Walsh School. Um, he's also on the editor editorial boards uh, of a few major journals, including Studies in Conflict and Terrorism, uh, which I would recommend very highly uh, for uh, particularly this topic. Um, he, you may have come across him recently. He's been um, on a few circuits, he's been talking a lot recently about a great book he's written with Professor Bruce Hoffman, God, Guns and Sedition, uh, which is a great contribution to right wing terrorism. And he will talk to us a little bit about attempts to disrupt uh, the U.S. elections. Uh, but go ahead, Benjamin. Thank you. Testing, testing. All right. Thank you, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Jeanette for the opportunity to be in this room with all of you sharing on this topic. Uh, before I jump in, I have a slight caveat. Slides. Ah, perfect. So before I jump in, I have a caveat. The research behind uh, what I'm sharing today is the result efforts of uh, both myself and my colleague, uh, Olive Satria. Uh, and uh, it's really his comprehensive knowledge of the Indonesian terror landscape that has contextualized the data we gathered uh, for uh, the work we've done. So while my partner in crime can be here today, I'll try to do his part of the work justice, uh, especially since he's threatened to cancel our Bali trip if I mock this up. Um, so jumping right in, uh, a brief update on the Indonesian terror landscape. So as some of you might already be aware, the threat profile in Southeast Asia has greatly reduced over the past decade, with um, the inflection point really being the 2017 uh, failed Marawi siege uh, in the Philippines. So this is especially the case in terms of traditional threat assessments, uh, which prioritize uh, established organizations and successful attacks. So in Indonesia, we have the IS leading uh, Jamal Ansar Dela, JAD. Uh, we have, uh, that has since, um, thanks to the efforts of Indonesian counterterrorism forces, become greatly decentralized. So they're quite disorganized at this point in time. Uh, we have uh, uh, the occasional inspired actors. We have uh, small cells that are still active, uh, especially in the more far-flung uh, uh, regions within Indonesia, uh, but we haven't had uh, we haven't seen any uh, centralized uh, attempts or plots as we have seen in say back in 2016, 2015. So that's the Jamal Sharadal. We have the Jamal Islamiyah, uh, which is more AQ leaning. Uh, although know that neither of them are uh, official affiliates of either ISAQ. Um, so uh, for Jamal Islamia, they are busy with reorganization efforts after leadership change. Um, 
and uh, looking at strategic shifts, which actually we will be exploring soon. Uh, we also have the uh, Mujahideen of East Indonesia, MIT, which has largely been inactive for, uh, I'd say, the last five or six years or so. Uh, at the same time, uh, extremist organizations uh, that are tied uh, historically to radicalization and recruitment uh, have been suppressed within Indonesia uh, at times uh, for uh, reasons of counterterrorism, at times for uh, other political purposes. Uh, but suffice to say, uh, the two of the major uh, organizations that fall in this category, Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia and the Islamic Defenders Front, FPI, uh, are currently banned organizations within, uh, uh, within Indonesia, uh, with the caveat that FPI has actually uh, rebranded themselves as another organization, also named as the FPI. It's very confusing. So, uh, looking beyond the traditional threat assessment, though, uh, uh, we see a slightly different picture, especially within the online sphere. So, what we're seeing in the online sphere is a rise in localized propaganda efforts. There's a notable resurgence uh, in mainstream social media platforms of uh, a community of pro-IS supporters, uh, and uh, they are sharing translated uh, IS uh, content coming straight from Central IS, uh, and to a lesser extent, some smaller communities that are doing the same but for AQ content. Uh, these are largely attributed to uh, communities that exist on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, that uh, are very familiar with each other, that we share each other's content. Uh, and many of the accounts in these communities hold the line, uh, mostly sharing borderline content. Although in some cases, they straight out break uh, the line by sharing uh, weekly editions of El Nava, uh, the latest uh, uh, video uh, productions, especially from uh, the Africa Wilayats. Uh, so this, while most of these uh, uh, individuals uh, would previously have been picked up by the now uh, dismantled JI or JAD networks, uh, especially the Madrasa and small group offline networks, uh, with their absence, many of them are now being funneled into these uh, mainstream social media communities uh, and being fed the products of IS's global media campaign. So that's not to say that the de-radicalization and PCB efforts in Indonesia uh, have been ineffective. However, we're not only dealing with a massive population, uh, but uh, we're not only dealing with a massive population with limited resources to do so, but there's also the issue of uh, Islam and the definition of extremism, which in Indonesia is a highly politicized topic. So this leads us on, uh, this brings us to uh, the topic today. Historically speaking, uh, attempts to interfere in Indonesian elections have taken two forms. The first is an attempt to undermine the validity and legitimacy of the elections. Uh, and the second are attempts to directly disrupt the elections. So looking at the former, uh, we see strong influences uh, uh, from central IS and AQ narratives uh, uh, leading the uh, narratives that come out within Indonesia on uh, undermining elections. So, for example, uh, in 2009, we had an individual named Muhammad Fakhri. Uh, he wrote a series of editorials for the El Mujahirin magazine uh, focusing on anti-election narratives, uh, specifically uh, uh, throwing back to the slogan of don't vote, stay Muslim, uh, which is a reference to the UK-based ideologue, uh, Omar Bakri. Uh, so Bakri would later co-found Jamaa Islamiyah, uh, uh, as mentioned earlier, one of the most prominent terror organizations within Indonesia. And anti-election narratives would later remain a focal point of JI propaganda campaigns in the offline sphere. Uh, as for attempts to disrupt the elections, uh, I won't go in depth into the outright attacks that have occurred. Uh, suffice to say, each of the national elections that have been held over the past decade uh, have been marked by attempted bombings, targeting either mass gatherings or politicians and officials.
So the elections this year in 2024 uh, may have seemed to escape this trend of attacks, but it should be noted that that's really thanks to the efforts of Densus 88, Indonesia's counterterrorism detachment. Uh, in 2023, they uncovered a large-scale sophisticated plot led by a faction of JAD under a militant named Abu Omar. Uh, this is another reminder that despite the reduced threat profile uh, of established terrorist organizations in Indonesia, traditional attacks are not a thing of the past. So we can't look back on the attacks in 2021 and think that, okay, that's not going to happen again. So moving on to why I think most of us are interested in here is uh, how the digital landscape has connected to these attempts to undermine and disrupt elections. So in terms of undermining elections, uh, we have a focus on theological argumentation. This is nothing new. Uh, this is pretty much the case uh, for any uh, IS or AQ playbook when it comes to elections interference uh, in most parts of the world. Uh, as noted, there is the earlier connection to central IS and AQ propaganda. Uh, however, it's worth noting that in recent times, we have seen more and more localized narratives uh, being shared by the pro-IS uh, community. So for example, in 2023, if you look at the top middle uh, image, uh, in 2023, a video was circulated of a young boy allegedly named Ali Borak uh, in Turkey. Uh, declaring that democratic elections were sure, uh, also known as uh, polytheism. Uh, there's nothing in this video that exhibits really extremist tendencies. Uh, it's really more of a political statement uh, rather than any reference to established terrorist organizations. Uh, however, what is notable, uh, we found in Indonesia, was that it was really strongly circulated within these pro-IS communities, particularly on Facebook, uh, so what we would see is uh, this video that's also being shared in the mainstream being circulated alongside uh, El Nava editorials uh, and also the individuals involved in the circulation after some brief uh, OSINT digging uh, were revealed to have uh, links with uh, GI or JAD with some of them declaring that uh, they were uh, involved in the training camps, involved in the charity organizations uh, that were involved in terrorist financing, so on and so forth. As for calls to action, uh, we've had some suspects arrested in Riau province uh, in 2024 uh, for making an online call to violence, uh, specifically what they uh, stated their intent was in the police reports was to create chaos prior to the 2024 elections. Uh, this again is a continuation of the uh, previous playbook of uh, attempting to disrupt the elections. And lastly, we have the disinformation campaigns. So uh, this really came to a head in the 2019 Indonesian elections, uh, where court records uh, of um, uh, arrested GI members show that they internally had declared a strategy of information warfare uh, as a response to uh, the 2019 elections. So this information warfare, which was essentially a flood of disinformation, uh, particularly with regards to President Joko Widodo, uh, was run by websites uh, set up by uh, JI. Uh, these websites were quickly shut down uh, however, what has since been passed uh, counterterrorism efforts uh, is the uh, large uh, volume of disinformation that is run again, as with the Ali Borat video, by the pro IS supporters. Uh, for example, uh, accusations that uh, some of the uh, people, uh, some of the individuals running for the elections this time around uh, were. Uh, uh, blasphemous, uh, as well as accusations of uh, Jokowi attempting to steal the elections uh, this year, uh, which is an interesting callback to uh, events happening in the West as well. So these pro I supporters um, that uh, I've mentioned multiple times in this presentation, uh, I think it's important that we talk briefly on who they are. Uh, 
uh, some of this might really be very familiar to those in this room. Uh, what IS has termed internally as the Isdarat al Ansar uh, are unofficial uh, supporters uh, that are not tied to any specific uh, media wing. Um, they are seen as central to the global uh, cyber jihad, uh, and they are being increasingly integrated into umbrella networks, uh, such as the Persan al Tarjuma, which is uh, mainly focused on translation efforts, uh, as well as the Ilam Foundation, which is focused on translation and dissemination. Uh, so, and not only that, they are not just involved in dissemination and translation anymore, uh, they are more and more being given an official role in content creation and especially localizing uh, global narratives towards regional and local uh, uh, developments. Uh, this is the point where if you look on Elan Foundation's website now, uh, they have basically given uh, uh, them their own category alongside mainstay publications such as El Nava. So if you look at the bottom there, Design Ansha uh, is uh, basically uh, Ansha Designs. Uh, which are uh, all the posters uh, that are made by um, uh, uh, the Isdara al And uh, as those familiar with Elan Foundation would know, this is repeated across uh, all the other languages. And whatever language is being chosen, uh, whichever language category is chosen, you have the uh, Isdara al specific to that language, which means you have localized regional narratives specific uh, to uh, the respective language within that category. So this is just a variety of examples of the content creation that has been occurring with regards to uh, Indonesian elections. Uh, uh, these are pretty par for the course. Uh, some of them you might just uh, expect to see in uh, highly politicized uh, groups instead of extremist groups. Uh, one thing I want to note is the example on the right uh, is a meme creation group uh, where uh, we were monitoring them for a while and we know that not all the members within the group were necessary, necessarily card-carrying supporters of established jihadist networks, uh, but they were nevertheless involved uh, in the creation of uh, extremist content. Uh, perhaps because of their political affiliations, perhaps because of their social economic grievances, or as we're familiar with the internet, perhaps just cause for, as you say, the laws. So lastly, uh, I'm gonna end with the trend that is perhaps uh, the most interesting aspect uh, of all this uh, and of all that uh, uh, we've touched on today. That is, uh, a notable move uh, in Indonesia by uh, established terrorist organizations, especially Jama Islamia, away from undermining and disrupting the Indonesian elections towards exploiting them, meaning they actually want the elections to occur uh, despite the uh, theological implications of that. Uh, and uh, instead, they want the elections to occur and for Jamal Islamia to have a hand within whatever is going to occur next. Uh, the backdrop of this is uh, in back in 2016, there was a major movement called the 212 movement uh, against uh, an Indonesian Chinese governor of Jakarta uh, who was accused of blasphemy. Uh, what happened then is that we saw an alliance of both extremists and non extremist uh, political Islamist organizations come together. Uh, hold a mass protests, uh, a lot of political activism during that period. Uh, and this served uh, as a proof of concept for Jamal Islamia. So moving forward on to 2019, which uh, some scholars, especially uh, Nava Nurinia, who is an excellent Indonesian scholar, uh, has stated to be the peak of Islamist influence uh, uh, within Indonesia. Uh, we saw this individual, Farid Okba, who is a JI member, found two political parties. Uh, the first is the Masyumi party, and the second was the PDRI party, uh, both of which did not specifically state any affiliation to JI. Uh, however, 
we do have uh, some sources uh, looking into uh, what the PDRI party represented. We have the website, uh, we have uh, evidence of its online outreach, and it's quite notable that they use popular online discourse uh, that relate back to uh, the larger narratives uh, that we see within the Indonesian extremist content uh, narrative discourse. Uh, and lastly, in addition to this, today, what we've seen are the attempts uh, that we have awareness of. Uh, it's worth noting that JI and JAD uh, are very quiet. Uh, they are not careless uh, in terms of uh, their larger strategy. Uh, and they've been quite smart in keeping their cards close to their chest. Uh, these are the attempts we're aware of. There are many other uh, aspects of this that we're not aware of. So, for example, recently it was revealed that um, uh, one of the ulama involved uh, in approving charities uh, within uh, Indonesia was, in fact, also a JI uh, affiliated member. Or, oh, sorry, he wasn't a member, but he was heavily involved within JI. So there is evidence that they, that GI is restructuring into a two-tiered um, organization uh, in which one tier is aiming to be a public-facing uh, uh, organization that is involved in politics and the other, the more traditional side of militancy. So these are just some uh, implications uh, for practitioners and policymakers. Uh, they are pretty much what you would expect. However, one thing I do want to point out that um, I think is quite important for us to realize is that the traditional relationship between the center of uh, Islamist extremism and the periphery of Islamist extremism is changing. Uh, uh, I'm stealing this idea from Jacob Zen, who is a great um, uh, scholar on uh, 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 Africa. Uh, who was talking about Africa as part of the periphery uh, when he was uh, with us in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and in the same way, Southeast Asia is also part of what is known as the periphery of Islamist extremism. Uh, but the relationship here has changed. The periphery is no longer simply just aping what the center is doing. Uh, but instead, what we're seeing now is that the periphery is taking from the center uh, the legitimacy that the center grants uh, and using it towards their own very specific agendas, some of which are very distinct from the strategies that have traditionally been employed uh, in the center. The other point, and lastly, is to note that um, this might in fact come back, uh, come back to impact what the center is planning to do and its strategic outlook in the future. Um, the, uh, we have seen intense signal uh, by the center through numerous Alnaba uh, publications, through numerous speeches and so on, uh, that uh, their strategy is to evolve as well alongside what they see as the global cyber jihad, alongside the increasing legitimization of the Istarat al Ansa. Uh, it is possible and in fact uh, likely that we're going to see uh, more and more a strategy that involves uh, the periphery, not just as uh, secondary movers, but as partners in terms of how they figure out uh, their role in the learning competition together. Thank Thanks, you. Benjamin. Thank you. I'm going to move on uh, to Jacob quickly, just to, I mean, say very interesting. I mean, I'm personally been very interested in Jamal Salmiya over the years, going back to the years of Abu Bakr and Basir and the Bali bombings. And it's interesting to see it continue to evolve, adapt, moving maybe from a more anti-voting, shirk-based ideology to actually trying to exploit and take part, or not perhaps take part in elections, but encourage people to vote in ways that are beneficial to JI. That's quite an interesting development. You don't usually see jihadist groups doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's fascinating. Uh, there's a lot actually I'd want to talk about, but I, I do want to move on quickly. We'll, we'll move on to Jacob first, um, if that's all right, uh, on the US elections, uh, and then uh, finish off with John. Thank you. Go ahead, Jacob. Wonderful. Can you see me and hear me? Yes. All good. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, 
Greetings, everybody, from a sunny early morning Washington, D.C. Alex, it's always such a pleasure and honor to speak with the GNET audience, um, whether in talks or in conversation on the website. And uh, thank you for that generous introduction. Um, so as Alex said, my name is Jacob, and I work um, largely on far-right terrorism, really white supremacist terrorism. Um, I have a book that's out this year called God, Guns, and Sedition, looking at this issue. And since that came out, I've been turning my attention increasingly to the 2024 US presidential election, where there is a lot of concern here about uh, disruption, election integrity, and how that's going to be covered, and of course, violence. And um, I do think that has a pretty strong technology um, nexus, especially with artificial intelligence and uh, generative AI, such as deep fakes. Um, so what I thought I would do today is is break my my remarks up into into three categories in terms of how I think this technology poses a growing risk to democracy. So the the kind of the limited impact is the speed and scale of radicalization that we're going to see from artificial intelligence. Um, the medium impact is deep fakes and the ability to create actual untruths. Um, the third largest impact, the largest threat to democracy in this space is what is what we call the liar's dividend um, and what AI can do in that space. So um, we'll get to that towards the end. And the ultimate argument here is that even though we've been thinking about AI and, and all, you know, places like GNET and GIFCT have been thinking about AI for years now, even with all that prep work, um, we've all kind of been caught asleep at the wheel and these technologies have arrived now and they're ready to disrupt our elections in ways that are very, very serious. Um, and we're going to see that this year, I think. So first of all, let me start off with what AI is going to mean for radicalization. And I think really that can be boiled down into two words, speed and scale. Now, this analysis rests on a fundamental premise here, which is although terrorists extremists always use new technologies, they typically do so in a way that advances what they are already doing, as opposed to inventing wholesale new uh, modus operandi. Terrorists always use new communications technology, whether it's 24-hour news cycle or the internet, social media, live streams. But they typically do so in ways that echo the same conspiracy theories that have already been floating around. Uh, let me just give you one example. Um, I was recently doing some research on you know, white supremacy in the US context, and I came across the last speech ever given by Frederick Douglass, obviously a prominent US uh, abolitionist. Uh, this speech was posthumously published, and he was reflecting on the reasons why black men were being lynched in the Reconstruction South. And the three narratives that he came down on were that black men were lynched because of um, the alleged suppression of race riots. Black men were being lynched because of the alleged protection of the white vote. And black men were being lynched because of protection of white women from rapes. So race riots, white vote, and protection of white women. Um, those three narratives, 160 years later, and multiple generations of communications technology, those three narratives are still some of the most prominent ones we see in white supremacist manifestos, including among individuals who are uh, you know, sharing live streams. So again, AI use so far, particularly for propaganda, has largely advanced pre-existing narratives and sought to exploit pre-existing cleavages at greater speed and at greater scale. That is happening across the ideological spectrum. Uh, researchers Daniel Siegel and Bill Vachandra um, have, for instance, explored one case study of deepfakes amplifying the story of a Pakistani Muslim man claiming to directly communicate with the Prophet Muhammad and God, calling for the deepest depth of hellfire for those questioning his prophecies. Um, again, that's not new. Um, it's playing on earlier ideologies. Last thing I'll say here in the speed and scale of radicalization element is this is participatory. Um, this technology is, is diffusing. So it's also emphasizing some of those key push and pull factors like a search for identity, a search for belonging, a search for purpose, 
um, that might be driving people into extremist networks in the first place, especially for younger tech savvy extremists, the ability to produce AI content, uh, content with a uh, extremist nexus can be a big reason why people might be might be participating in these networks. So we're going to see radicalization um, at greater speed and scale. The second element here is generative AI, particularly deep fake technology, and the ability to create out of thin air um, actual untruths. So this can be used both to undermine a political opponent in an election, as well as to support one's own side. So you're creating evidence that can both undermine an opponent and uh, kind of support your own your own side's narrative. Let me give you two examples, firstly, on the undermine side and how they're impacting Western democracies today. So first of all, I think one of the reasons why there's a lot of concern around this point is we've actually already seen deep fake technology impact the US presidential election. Um, in New Hampshire, during the primary campaign a couple of months ago, a um, what's the best way to describe this? A phone call circulated of President Biden telling constituents, telling voters in New Hampshire not to vote in the primary election. Basically, the narrative was um, if you vote in the New Hampshire primary, it's not really going to impact the general election. In order to defeat Trump, you have to vote in November instead. Um, that phone call was a artificially generated um, piece of content. Now, very strange case uh, featuring actually a rogue rival, rogue operative working for a rival um, candidate on the Democrat side. That individual would later claim that he was only releasing the deep fake in order to, um, or the, the radio, the phone call, in order to raise the alarm about AI and its role in democracies. He actually said, this is a way for me to make a difference. And I have. I can tell you they're not used to me. I wrestled in college. Um, he's now facing charges uh, related to, to that scam, uh, which is good. Um, the UK has seen it too. So after the latest outbreak of hostilities between uh, Israel and Hamas, fake audio circulated claiming to show London Mayor Sadiq Khan announcing that the city was going to forego the annual Armistice, Armistice Day commemoration in favor of a pro-Palestine march. Uh, the mayor's office declared that that audio was being circ uh, circulated and amplified by a far-right group. Um, moreover, interestingly, in this case, the Metropolitan Police specifically stated that this piece of content did not uh, constitute a, a crime. So that's that undermine portion. Now, if you look at how deepfakes are being used to support narratives or support certain candidates, um, there we get into more hypothetical space. It isn't happening at such a great scale just yet. Let me give you a couple of examples of what this looks like with the caveat that one of the things that's really frightening is when you get into the hypotheticals of what people could do with AI, you can really play that game forever and get into some really, really dark, <laughs> dark corners. So to give you one example, uh, the QAnon movement has succeeded in mass radicalizing the American public by sharing alleged drops of government malfeasance from a self-proclaimed privileged perch within government, right? Q. Imagine if a successful deepfake claiming to depict the Q character from QAnon calling for violence against President Trump's rivals in government was released at a particularly opportune time let's say halfway through a January 6th kind of incident, how could that change the trajectory of that kind of moment? Second possible example here. Uh, one of the challenges that the Trump campaign faced in the 2020 election cycle is that effectively they tried to claim that the election was stolen. They tried to claim that there was massive fraud uh, when there wasn't any, which means they didn't have any evidence for their claims. That's not going to be the case this time. There will be evidence because the evidence is going to be created. You're going to have videos and audio of politicians claiming to release the information, claiming to confess 
to the crimes that they committed. You're going to have videos of um, incidents at uh, voting centers, at tallying centers, showing fraud. So those allegations are going to be backed up with backed up with proof um, that is going to be artificially generated. Now, false inflammatory information or statements by trusted authority figures, election misinformation or other distortions of social and political events are all likely to incite violence, presenting the possibility of a second January 6th, of course, or something far worse. However, both are also forms of voter suppression that may contribute to voters being swayed at a significant scale. However, I would argue the biggest threat right now is something that we call the liar's dividend, which is the idea that as the information space grows more saturated with artificially generated content, and information in general becomes less reliable, actors may be able to dismiss legitimate or real content as generated or fake content. In other words, in this information wasteland, the actor, the benefits, is going to be the liar. To give one example of what this looks like, in March, an individual from Illinois was arrested for firing a gun outside the US Capitol on January 6, 2021. Two interesting things emerged from his arraignment this month. On the one hand, he declared that he had nothing to worry about because Trump would be re-elected re in six months and he would then be pardoned. So he's not taking the court case seriously in the first place. But secondly, according to the Law and Crime website, he told authorities that a lot of his social media posts including one from someone using his name in October 2023, where he appears to be racking the slide of a semi-automatic weapon, was artificial intelligence. So here is somebody taking legitimate content, legitimate crimes that he has committed, and dismissing them as being fake. Moreover, the lies dividend, I argue, underscores the reality that these actors are actually play, uh, plowing very fertile ground here. According to a recent poll conducted by Gallup, only 32% of the American population reports having a great deal or a fair amount of confidence that the media reports the news in a full, fair, and accurate way. So needless to say, this fits well with the MAGA movement's fake news narrative. The Bipartisan Policy Center, meanwhile, found that only 50% of Republicans express confidence that votes will be counted accurately at the national level. Now, those numbers are not going to ameliorate from an environment with even greater insecurity over content and its veracity. One of the key elements here is that, as with social media, AI and deepfakes are going to be an equalizer for bad actors. Let me quote my CFR colleague, Kat Duffy, from an article she co-authored earlier this year in Foreign Affairs. Kat writes, quote, the level of expertise required to create and disseminate fake texts imagery, audio clips, and video recordings across multiple languages will continue to plummet without any commensurate increase in the public's ability to identify, investigate, or debunk this media, end quote. Extremist groups across the ideological spectrum and both within and outside the US will be able to weaponize American social media platforms to advance their views through manipulated content. States too will use these platforms, perhaps even in tandem with extremist groups to undermine and polarize the United States, including during this election cycle. Now, there is a fourth possible category of threat to democracy here, and that is outright cyber attacks enabled or accelerated by AI in places like polling centers. Again, speed and scale of AI might allow nefarious actors to attempt to overwhelm cyber defenses with massive data dumps. AI can either create a mass-produced disruptive content or identify vulnerabilities in cyber defenses. But I do want to use this possible scenario as a baseline for a more optimistic counter-argument of the entire talk here, and that is we are actually quite resilient and threats against US elections are not new. As an article co-authored by Jen Easterly, who is head of our cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency here, found, quote, there is no evidence that any voting system lost any votes or was compromised in any other way in any national election since election infrastructure was designated as critical infrastructure in 2017. 
And of course, the Department of Homeland Security is handling this problem with urgency. In an intelligence bulletin released to ABC News earlier this month, the DHS documented that, quote, as the 2024 election cycle progresses, generative AI tools likely provide both domestic and foreign threat actors with enhanced opportunities for interference by aggravating emergent events, disrupting election processes, or attacking election infrastructure. So we know that the US government is vigilant on the cyber threat side. But that's just the law enforcement and intelligence side of the equation, which is always going to be largely reactive. We also need to, keep, to be proactive to get ahead of this threat. So what do we do about it? Well, I argue that we need to be looking at both supply and demand of this content on the supply side. So how do you handle the production and dissemination of this technology? We need to be thinking about watermarking AI generated content. We need to be thinking about hashing databases, uh, community um, notes. So how do you have people participating in dialogue uh, in public forums about this content? We might want to think about outright bans on certain forms of artificially generated content. We might want to be thinking about outright bans on all artificially generated content. If we cannot guarantee that these technologies will be handled safely, responsibly, in a ways that protect democracy, at least in the short term, we do need to think about ways to limit their spread. Now, assuming that's going to be quite difficult, we also should be thinking about the demand side, and that means implementing digital literacy programming as an urgent priority. Digital literacy is the range of education tools to teach people to be able to spot mis and disinformation on their own, whether that's lateral reading, whether it's verifying sources. Um, we need to be thinking about this at every level of our community um, with regards to deep fakes and artificially generated content. Now, a 2023 study found that participants could correctly identify a deepfake 73% of the time. That's not terrible, but it does still leave a lot of room where these technologies can corrode minds and corrode public faith, um, including in our election. So we do need to get that number closer to, to 100 if we can. Obviously, we're facing a, a real uphill battle in that as this technology is also improving. The third category of countermeasures, frankly, is weaponizing AI to use it against extremist groups, whether by identifying patterns in communication and organizing or by spreading counter narratives at greater speed and scale. Those, I argue, will remain longer term ambitions. We are not going to get there in 2024. So we do need to think about some of these other ways to protect our democracy from bad actors seeking to use emerging technologies to disrupt our election. With that, Alex, I'll turn it over to you. Happy to expand on anything in the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. A um, couple of very useful insights. I think linking the Frederick Douglass analysis uh, to the problems we have today is quite useful, insightful, gives some good context to the historical roots of this problem, but also you know, the new modern challenges. Um, I think the idea of both creating untruths to undermine opponents, but also using this technology to help the candidates you support. Also, this other consideration where things can now be dismissed, things people don't like can be dismissed as fake. Uh, that's a, you know something I hadn't quite thought about. It's a, obviously a very clear challenge, but also I guess the challenge of people talking about media literacy as, as a response is absolutely crucial, but the continuing challenge of people will believe, you know, what they want to believe. So it's, that's the other challenge that may not be just totally surmountable. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Just a reminder, those online, uh, you can uh, put questions in the Q&A box on, on your Zoom panel there. Um, and finally, uh, we'll hear from John Sunday Ojo um, on Nigeria Boko Haram elections. Uh, please go ahead. You can go ahead and share your screen and your slides, John, if, uh, if, if that's possible. Thank you, Alex.
at the moment we can see you, but not your screen uh, or your, your slides. Um, if you're struggling to share the screen, you might want to just, you can go ahead on with your talk. Uh, like. Already have the slides. So we have, yeah, we have it. Okay. We do also have your slides. Oh, we got, I think it might be. Okay, I think we got you there. Yeah. Okay, that's looks good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will be presenting on the uh, uh, Boko Haram and election disruption in Nigeria. I think it is very important to look at the uh, what led to the emergence of uh, Boko Haram in the northern Nigeria and how it migrates uh, from uh, how it, it got to the level of uh, splitting into a factional group. The emergence of uh, Boko Haram and uh, its factional group uh, called uh, Islamic uh, State West Africa Province, uh, popularly known as uh, ISWAP. Uh, Boko Haram emerged in 2009 in the northern part of Nigeria, um, uh, to be precise, in Bombono State. Uh, the, the, the group has become a, a security threat to Nigeria, to, to Nigeria environment since 2019. And from that period, since uh, its emergence, it, it, it has focused on its ideological uh, component on uh, uh, Western education and uh, Western democracy, which it considered as forbidden within the Nigeria political space. And since then, Boko Haram has been uh, expanding even beyond the Nigeria uh, political environment. And we can see the activities of Boko Haram in the Lake Chad region that constitute uh, Chad, Niger, Cameroon, uh, within that axis. So uh, when, when it comes to uh, the ideological standing of, uh, of Boko Haram, it's considered in a Western democracy as, uh, as, as, as corrupt. So it, 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 it was like there was a need to, to replace this political system with, with something new, especially something that based on uh, medieval uh, Islamic uh, caliphate ideology, a situation whereby you have a, a, a Sharia, uh, Sharia, uh, Sharia law as a governing principles in Nigeria. So this has been the major uh, ideological uh, focus of Boko Haram. Uh, they want a kind of system that that, that will that will propagate the Islamic doctrines within Nigeria political environment. Considering the issue of uh, election disruption. Boko Haram started uh, th this agenda, especially in the pre-election uh, environment uh, in, 20, in 2015. And it's it, it considered both, non, both Muslim and non-Muslim as, uh, as infidels. Uh, and, and anyone that participates, whether you are a Muslim or, or you belong to other, other faith, they consider such a person as, uh, as infidel. So, if you're involved in, in, in election or electioneering campaigns. So such a, such a person can be, can be tagged as an infidel. So they base this ideological uh, standing on this, uh, on this principle. There are several methods used uh, to disrupt election in Nigeria by Boko Haram. Firstly, uh, uh, Boko Haram utilizes uh, online propaganda especially by creating video and some other narratives online on social media to, to sell uh, its own agenda to the, to the general populace. And also, it's also considered bombing, uh, bombing uh, something like uh, using suicide uh, bombers to, to scare people. And uh, also, he also instrumentalized kidnapping and uh, focusing on the 
uh, military and uh, civilian target in order to intimidate the local, local population. Uh, I think it is important to quickly look at the, at, uh, the video uh, promoted by the former, former uh, Boko Haram leader, Abubakar Chikau, in the uh, pre-2015 uh, general election. The reason and meaning of this message is we are the ones who fought against you in Gombe, and Allah only knows what we found there. You don't need to know it. You are claiming that we don't know how to fight. But we forced your forces to flee from their bases, and we freed our imprisoned brothers from the prisons that you oppressed them in. Only praise be to Allah. Alhamdulillah. And finally, we say that these elections that you are planning to do will not happen in peace, even if that costs us our lives. Allah will not leave you to proceed with these elections even after us, because you are saying that authority is from people to people which means that people should rule each other. But Allah says that the authority is only to him. Only his rule is the rule who applies on this land. Following the, uh, after the, well, Shekau released this video, uh, we we observed evidence of, the, of of that video uh, in Gombe. There was a particular uh, invasion and the killing of uh, voters in Gombe, in particular, uh, in, in the pre twenty fifteen election. Uh, we 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 experienced uh, invasion of villages and the polling centers were. Uh, by Boko Haram that led to the, the deaths of 40, 41 people, including the legislature. Such an event was used to scare the, the, the local community, especially from participating in election and in the electioneering campaign uh, in, in 2015. Following that, there was a particular event that also, also erupted uh, in 2019 uh, in the pre-election environment in 2019, especially a few hours to, to the election, Boko Haram fire rocket on Maiduguri, and uh, Maiduguri uh, is located is the is the capital of uh, Bono State, uh, where uh, we consider as the epicenter of uh, Boko Haram insurgency in Nigeria. So these two attempts were the what the what the the uh, uh, approach is uh, used by the by Boko Haram uh, to disrupt the Nigeria election during this uh, particular period. There are several impacts of this uh, uh, election disruption, especially on local community and the general citizenry. Uh, it has a psychological uh, effect on voters. Especially if, for instance, now if somebody uh, experienced uh, such an invasion, it will be difficult for such a person to to participate in the electoral ele electoral process, if, in, including the uh, in the near future. And also, such an environment also creates an enabling uh, uh, environment for for election manipulation. We have seen several. Uh, political contestants that uh, that uh, uh, utilized such an opportunity, you know, to to maneuver election results uh, in all these uh, vulnerable uh, local communities uh, in the northern part, part of Nigeria. Uh, the event also also uh, had an impact on uh, election postponement. Uh, the Nigeria general election was postponed uh, in twenty in twenty fifteen, I think, by uh, six weeks due to the uh, activities of Boko Haram. 
And uh, we also consider the uh, Futa Sapati, especially when we look at the uh, uh, the, the turnout in the, the, during the, the, the election. So it has a lot of, it, it has a great impact on the Futa set turnout during the 2015 election. And looking at the general uh, democratic landscape, uh, Boko Haram uh, 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 invasion also undermined the uh, entire democratic uh, process, uh, in the, especially in the 2015 uh, uh, general election in Nigeria. What are uh, uh, so what, what can we consider, especially when we when we when we look at the state's response uh, towards the activities of this uh, jihadist uh, group? Uh, I know that Nigeria uh, heavily relied on the military uh, uh, military assets, especially uh, when it comes to uh, combating insurgency and terrorism in Nigeria. So military assets. Uh, uh, were mobilized during this uh, process, and also government also employ uh, what I we call a counter propaganda, especially through through media outlets, in order to counter the the narrative of uh, the insurgent group uh, in Nigeria. Uh, also, in some of the vulnerable uh, communities, uh, we have we have uh, witnessed uh, several uh, polling booths that were relocated to a safer area where people were able to, to vote during the election. And also uh, the government also provided the humanitarian support to the to people that were affected by, by the invasion of Boko Haram in the northern part of, Ni of Nigeria. Uh, when it comes to strategies for miti mitigating uh, uh, election disruption by by a jihadist group. One of the strategies that uh, Nigerian states employ is, is the inauguration of uh, informal security uh, outfit. Uh, they are popularly known as uh, civilian the JTF. Uh, they were mobilized in order to to make the local community more resilient against the activities of Boko Haram in the, especially in ungoverned spaces uh, where the, there is a limited uh, state presence. So when it, uh, when it comes to uh, improving election security also, I think there is also a need uh, to, to work on uh, uh, electoral uh, infrastructure to to make it more resilient against the activities of a, of a jihadist group. And we can also consider the uh, leveraging on the intelligence. Uh, I think uh, Nigeria, uh, when it comes to intelligence uh, gathering, uh, I've not seen the, the, the robustness of such a, the, a, such, a, such a landscape where uh, the government uh, employ the intelligence uh, received from the from 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 their from their uh, from their expert, you know, <laughs> to to combat uh, the uh, Boko Haram insurgency and uh, utilize it for uh, secure election disruption uh, by Boko Haram. Uh, I think I also consider E fourteen. E14 could be an, another alternative, especially for the people living in all these uh, vulnerable areas where, uh, where, where uh, voting or participating in the electoral process uh, could be at, at risk. So if government can devise something like a, uh, a platform for e voting for the people in these uh, vulnerable areas, I think it will mitigate the 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 risk that people may may be may, may confront with in such an environment. Moreover, we can also consider uh, that government should look beyond the military approach, which I consider kinetic mechanism, 
uh, what I refer to in one of my work as uh, a governance approach to, co to counter terrorism. Nigeria has been capitalizing on the military approach in fighting insurgency in northern Nigeria. I think it is high time to redefine this strategy and uh, employ governance dimension uh, in fighting terrorism and insurgency in northern Nigeria. Another approach that could be employed is a uh, collaboration with international organization and uh, some of the advanced democracies of the world, like um, United States of America uh, and some other countries, you know, to to to, to contribute to the to, to the infrastructural resilience of of, uh, of the country. I think that could also uh, mitigate the uh, election disruption by uh, by Bo by Boko Haram. Conclusively. I consider Boko Haram uh, 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 intervention in the electoral process uh, as a threat. But looking at the Nigeria political space, uh, Boko Haram has a potential to disrupt election, but at the local level. Because when we consider, when we consider the 2015 election and, and 2019 election, I, I observe that the activities of Boko Haram affected those that were in the remote villages most compared to, to those at the, at the urban areas. So it has capacity to, to disrupt election, but at the remote, at the, at the local level. So I, I may conclude by saying that uh, future disruption of uh, election why not be by invading communities? It will be through uh, electoral cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, very useful overview. I, I was especially surprised. I wasn't aware they managed to actually postpone election to an attack. You can imagine the disruption and ripple effects of that can even impact the outcomes of an election pretty directly.